Hi everyone, I'm Erin Reynolds, and I'm one of the co-chairs of IndieCade this year. Hi everyone, year. I'm Erin Reynolds, absolute and pleasure I'm one of the co-chairs of uh, IndieCade celebration of Electric Zine Maker as part of the IndieCade Summer Series. Um, Electric Zine Maker by Alien Melon is a bit hard to describe. It's a delightful, creative, powerful, um, utterly charming experience. It's an art toy print shop creation experience for making zines. Um, and for those of you who don't know what zines are, um, they're basically mini magazines that are independently produced and distributed and can cover any number of topics and interests. Um, I'm doing the rich history of zines a, a great disservice um, with that very short, super simplified explanation. So I do encourage you to look them up. They're an incredible art form and medium for self-expression and communication. Um, and more so, I encourage you to download and play Electric Scene Maker to create your own zine, either for yourself um, and or to share with others. Um, and if you're still not sure uh, what exactly I'm talking about, that's okay, because in just a few moments, we'll be joining Natalie Lawhead of Alien Melon and Celia Pierce for a conversation about Electric Scene Maker and more. But first, here are a couple of videos about the one-of-a-kind Electric Scene Maker experience. Hi, my name is Alien Melon, and I'm the creator of the Electric Zine Maker. And it, the Z Electric Zine Maker is a workshop slash art toy that's meant for making and building zines. It's currently under development, and it's a prototype. Not a prototype. It's a beta. It's a public beta. And um, yeah, it has a bunch of really cute art tools that come with it that are all meant to be experimental and goofy and silly and just kind of encourage casual creation. It's free on itch, so yeah, thank you. Go check it out. Hi, Natalie. It's so great to see you. Hi, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. It's so exciting. Um, so uh, welcome, uh, for people who don't know Natalie, she's like a longtime IndieCade veteran alumna and has, I think, won two awards now, is that right? Yes. Um, so, and, and really kind of one of those people that many people would, would say like, this is the type of work that IndieCade was meant for. So <laughs> happy to have her here in our summer series. Um, so since, uh, since Aaron mentioned, um, the history of zines. I wanted to start by showing you a zine that I worked on in the 80s. So I'm going to try sharing my screen here. And this is, um, I'm just going to do my desktop because then I can. So this is a, a zine that I worked on in the 80s called Letters of Dysfunction. Oh, cool. a, and we, just, just for context, this is an eight and a half by 11 Xeroxed hand <laughs> booklet with electrical tape covering staples on the side that we made by hand in my friend Susan's house. Um, I worked on a few issues, both on graphics and poetry. Here's a couple of examples of some of my poetry layouts. And so the idea with these was like, they were sort of a combo of visual and poetry. But you can see like these are, uh, photo booth pictures that I then Xerox. So the reason I wanted to show this is because I think it provides a lot of insight into the style of Electric Zine Maker. It's very retro in a funny way. This is another one that I did. So I just wanted to show those um, for starters and then, you know, talk to you a little bit about the inspiration uh, for the game and, and other sorts of questions that we have and would want to talk about. So um, your work is, I, I was thinking about this because I was trying to figure this out, like it's so wildly original that I really, I really want to know like what inspires you? What, where do you get your aesthetic from? It's so distinctive. It's so unique to you. Like I can tell your work now when I see it, even <laughs> who made it. So I'd love to just hear a little bit about like where that inspiration comes from and where those ideas come from. Uh, I kind of always, I kind of grew up on computers and the internet because like I was very, uh, my parents moved around a lot. So computer and interacting with that was my main form of just existing. So it's kind of like I always, I always just lived in a virtual space. And uh, there's a lot of aspects about older computer culture that I miss a lot that I feel like we, we 
progress involved losing a lot. You know, it's not like it got better. A lot of aspects of it got lost, like the customizability of the internet and our own spaces and how wacky software used to be and uh, how wacky UI work used to be. So I throw back a lot, ba throw back to that a lot because I feel like it's a way of keeping it alive in your own work. If you miss something, you kind of keep it alive, you know, the values that you hold dear. So a lot of this stuff gets is inspired or informed by early internet and early culture. Um, the other thing I was thinking about too was um, because most of your work is, it's work that can be sort of, is sort of on the edge of game, like, which we love. And DK loves games that aren't quite games, but kind of are. Um, can you talk a little bit about, because one of the things I think you, you talked to me about in our email correspondence and a little bit also in the video is sort of the difference between a toy and a tool. Like, how is this a toy, how is it a tool, and where do those two things kind of intersect and bump into each other? Yeah, it's been a very, I explored this a lot while making this because I really do not want it to feel like a, a high pressure environment where your place now creates something and you know, like pe people, I see a blank canvas and they're like, oh God, this is too much pressure, I can't do this. Um, and uh, like early, the intersection with early software and uh, games, like especially entertainment, uh, had this. It was it, it was really interesting to me how it kind of you you weren't too sure if you were in a game or if it was a tool you're in, like creative writer suite or creative artist. I, I thought about that a lot because uh, the interface work or just the environments you're in is just silly and goofy. And then like you have Kai's power goo. Like I remember how. Uh, this it's it's stuff that's very unique to computers because like Kai's power goo is completely useless it's not founded in any rea any real world art tool it's it's uh something that's completely unique and new to computers so it's like the with our tools we have this space where we can explore things that are very unique to computer culture like glitch art and uh this uh, weird reaction and bugs bugs that, that happen in art software like make the tool out of those bugs you know so yeah in a way of making that accessible the right way to do that felt more like make it a toy and uh, interacting with it that feels more like a game and it's silly rather than a professional environment that lets you just create art so that was kind of like the going theme while building it was that this should really be a toy I, I have, there's two jumping off points from that I want to talk about. The first one is a really interesting kind of aesthetic conundrum and also decision that I think you consciously made, which is it's often been said that a game is something which deliberately makes something harder than it has to be, <laughs> right? And a tool is supposed to make things easier. Mm -hmm. Although I say supposed to because I think many tools do not do that. And that's what really intrigues me about this, this project is that it sort of has this high level of usability, in many ways, more usable than a real, real tool like Photoshop. Like I've been using Photoshop and InDesign a lot I'm working on my book and I, found, I find them to be really hard to use, whereas your electric zine maker is super easy. So at the, but at the same time, there are constraints introduced that are kind of like remind me a little bit of how when you're trying to make stories with the sims like they don't quite do what you want them to do but what they do that's different is more interesting mm -hmm. so that tension between like the challenge inherent uh, in a game design versus the usability inherent in a tool can you just talk about how you played at that intersection yeah um Usability is a really broad spectrum and I feel like a lot of our ideas of usability are informed by corporate tools or people that have money and kind of own the, this conversation where usability can be things that it's it should be applied on a per use basis. So here it's like when you open the electric Z makers, it's really 
wild, loud, bright, strange environment. Like, I don't know, it's, it's a little thing that I actually intentionally put in there. The slider with the, where you adjust the size is actually kind of wobbly, like it's, it's loose, you know? So a lot of that is very intentionally made to feel like you're in a plastic kid's toy, you know, like things are just chintzy and uh, kind of strange. And then there's little um, Easter eggs hidden in there, like where the UI will talk back to you and kind of share things, or you can find a little cat hidden in it. So it's kind of all these th aspects kind of encourage you to view it as, okay, I'm not in a normal art space. I'm in a, I'm, I'm exploring and uh, like I, I'm i really viewing it as I'm making a game. I don't want it to feel um, I like, yeah, you made a really good point where Photoshop is hard to use. And the thing with mainstream tools, the larger they are, the more they try to please everyone. Like if you're participating in a discussion for, you know, or betas for these tools, it's like they, uh, cast a very wide net and I feel like with smaller tools there's an advantage of that you cast a smaller net for a very specific case and uh, you're kind of it's it's a control kind of kind of like a controlled aesthetic like Bitsy is is a very small controlled case and the aesthetic is very unique to Bitsy and I think that's where where the intersection between game and toy and tool in the smaller tools is very obvious. You're, I'm sorry, I'm rambling. <laughs> it's like a lot to, uh, a lot of, a lot of ground I've covered while building it. So, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, the more you want to talk, the better. I mean, this means I'm asking the right questions, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's really, really interesting what you were saying because I, I was thinking about a really good metaphor for it is it's like kind of like a digital crayon box in a sense because, but you know, like big crayons or big, you know, when you get those giant chalk pieces because they're a little bit hard to use, but in an interesting way. And at mm -hmm. the same time, it's actually way easier to use. And I think one of the reasons for that, that it's easier to use than a regular tool is a lot of what those tools do in order to have that, what you were describing as kind of what I would call in software development an overscoping problem, right? Mm -hmm. Way too much scope is that many of the most powerful tools are invisible. And whereas in Electric Zine Maker, everything is visible. Like there's no secret key combination that you need to know in order to enlarge the screen or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, everything is very straightforward. It's like go forward, go back print out, everything's there and visible and fun. Like nothing is orthogonal. I love the fact that there's so many things that are like not straight. <laughs> and then you have like this random potato bouncing over here, which turns out to be the help button in a way. So it's just like, there's a kind of unexpectedness about it, but also a very, everything is, it's like an open book in a sense. Everything is there for you to access easily. Um, and then I wanted to follow up with something about the tech um, that actually really really fits what you were just talking about. Um, and it was why I wanted to show those, those uh, 20th century zine examples, because we were also playing with technology, right? We were playing with xerography. And one of the things we used to do a lot with the zine that we were working on was we would put weird things on the actual Xerox machine. Like, I just put like my driver's license or my face. I had a whole series that I did with my hands. So like, this is a weird thing. It's like having a scanner, right? So you could, you could make images with a Xerox machine that you couldn't make with any other technology. So what you're talking about reminds me of also of the early days of computers where there were certain types of aesthetics that were the direct product of the clunkiness of the tech. So um, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about that. Like there are certain, and, and this goes back to your aesthetic, like certain clunky things about the tech, I think you really love because I see them occur again and again in your work. Can you just give us a couple of examples of like your three favorite wacky clunky things about old tech that you like to work with? The very over compressed GIFs, kind of like the, the I, what I find really fascinating about looking at like those old GIFs is like all the dots, like the patterns they create. And it's very unique to computers. Like it's, I, you know, you, it, it's just from computers. It didn't come anywhere else. Or um, 
old web stuff like I love flash stuff you know like uh, the you're, you're browsing the web and suddenly you find someone's page in their back of their site and it's this ridiculous loud spa secret space of animation and just like what the hell is this haha <laughs> this is hilarious and you share it with all your friends and like oh my god what is like you found you found gold in a sense you know browsing the web like this strange little thing hidden I, I miss that a lot it's something I throw back a lot to or just the idea of rejecting usability in a way where you have to learn, where interacting with something is completely new. You have no idea what's going on. It's an alien space. It's almost like an alien device that you have to decipher on your own, but it's approachable enough where you do learn it and it's just a completely fresh experience for that. Is that where the name Alien Melon comes from? <laughs> yeah, like a brain from space. <laughs> it is kind of interesting to think about it in those terms. Like if you were an alien from another planet, you could use <laughs> Electric Seed Maker, right? For the most part. Um, oh, there was another. Oh, one of the things you touched on that was very interesting to me too was, we've, and, and I think it's something IndieCade has in many ways tried to be an antidote too, is there's this kind of fidelity war that's going on in mainstream games. And what you're really describing is the mainstream game industry is obsessed with making things not look digital or making them cinematic. And you're just just going in the completely opposite direction of that, right? It's, it's, low, it's kind of a lo-fi, almost, I hate to say this because it trivializes it a little bit, it's kind of almost a lo-fi fetishism that it's not, we all share, all of the indie people share this like, going back to platformers, like in Yes for Yule's book, he talks about why are so many indie games platformers, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's that nostalgia that you were talking about that we long for the, a time when what was happening on the computer was more interesting and more visible, more legible, right? Yeah, it was also, it belonged to everyone. It didn't just belong to rich people or corporations. And like, it's it's interesting, like the how you draw the correlation between AAA and indie with that. Like it's it's more than just nostalgia. It's it's embracing the uniqueness of the platform. Like AAA games, they do not age well. You know, like I can't. I you look back at these at older things that used to be this massive marketing push and hit, and all that's left is the pretentiousness. You know, the the art style is just. It's like I don't care it's not that pretty to look at anymore yes some of the writing yes it's, there's aspects of it that are good but overall well and i think a really interesting uh, kind of example of seeing that in action is a game like multiple where it where it's all these old games just kind of jammed together and it completely bastardizes them by just taking everything out of context and you just have to go through them but some of them it's really interesting how pretentious they almost are like it's you're it's obviously i i don't know the the word pretentious is all that i can come up with that when i talk about older aa games you know and then when we look back at it we cherry pick what we used to like about it and most of the time it's not the over the top art and the production it's the little moments in there that we loved like uh when you played Counter-Strike, then people made games based off throwbacks of the old bugs that happened when you interacted. So, you know, that's what I feel like these older aesthetics mean to us. We're taking what we miss and love, the little moments that are unique to computers and incorporating it into our work. Cool. So that, I want to ask you a few questions about your background, because I feel like I, I don't know that much about your history. Frankly, I didn't do my homework in that sense, but um, I know that you do everything yourself, right? You do all the writing, all the audio, all the coding, all the visuals. Do you have an arts background or a computing background or some combination thereof that kind of also maybe leads to your particular aesthetic? Yeah, uh, I started more with classic art and I was kind of on track of going to study uh, animation and I kind of got into some Disney programs where Disney animators would teach you animation. So that was kind of my first love was traditional animation and cartoons. 
And then I discovered the internet and I discovered like, oh my God, your art can be alive and accessible from anyone in the world. And it can, you know, interactivity was a big deal. So then I got into net art and then my first net art thing really took off and it became kind of a viral thing. And like uh, I had people sending me their resumes and I'm just some kid in high school, you know. And I, I don't know, I loved everything about that because you could have your own persona. No one has any idea who you are, or the person, and they all just have this idea that you're, I don't know, some big important person. Like, no, you're just the idiot in high school, you know? And then uh, it's kind of, that stuck with me. And when I was going to go into college, everyone was telling me that the internet has no future. It's niche. I'm ruining my future by doing this uh, computer art stuff. So it's kind of like I just skipped past that and just kept at it. And then eventually the net art started being called games and then I ended up in games, but it's kind of, I, I don't really view myself as doing games. I view it more as it's the part of that computer history where it's interactive art, you know, and, and it's probably more interesting if you don't apply a strict game label on it. Cause you start, you can, see it as part of the large, broader scope of exploration of what interactivity on in a computer even means. Yeah, I'm a big fan of games that blur that definition and that's something we always have striven for since we started Indicate because we felt like the most interesting things were those things that were somewhat ambiguous. Um, so the piece you did in high school that got a lot of attention, what was it called? Blue Suburbia, it was this animated interactive poetry book and it's kind of like you'd have this richly detailed and animated space and my inspiration for that was like Disney's Fantasia so it was like I wanted it was that kind of quality visual style and uh, you'd have things happening in the space and it's this really moody goth environment and you discover literature and through interact interacting with it uh the poems would reveal themselves. Like there was one that I thought was, I still think it's really interesting. You'd mouse over uh, environment and uh, pieces of the poem come together and the closer you get, then you hear audio and it's reading it off and the further away you, it fades and the next thing comes in. So it's like a different way of giving you literature instead of just reading it, you're moving in the actual literature. That, that was the idea of that one. It sounds almost like it, it almost becomes an elit project in that way too, which is a whole other genre of activity that bumps up against what we do. Um, so that's really interesting because, and I think this is, you know, the arts background makes a lot of sense because you often see artists working in low fidelity forms, even though they are perfectly capable of doing high fidelity. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting to note that you have done and can make Disney quality animation, but you choose this other style. Um, the other question I was gonna ask you there is, just following on that discussion more, is your aesthetic of interactivity. Like I see, there's sort of, people tend to think of aesthetics as visual design, but I also think about aesthetics as interaction design. Mm -hmm. So an example of something I absolutely love in Electric Zine Maker, um, and I'm gonna, a little later, I'll show you the, the zine that I made, that I made several very fast. By the way, I love that it's so fast. It, it doesn't give you time to think and fuss and be perfectionistic. You just, it's just like a toy, a paint box, a crayon box or whatever. But um, I love that, I love the scream into the void <laughs> option. It was so great because you know, you're going along and it's like, paintbrush a this a that and then there's this thing that just scream into the void and when you when you select it you get a ran a, a procedurally generated graphic and an actual scream and I <laughs> so much and I used it in a couple of different zine experiments that I was doing and then I put it through some of the filters um and it's actually it was really just fun because it was totally unexpected and um, there were a bunch of things like that, the fish going by, the bouncing potato, like you're just working and all of a sudden this goldfish swims by, right? Um, that element of surprise and discovery. So maybe I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about like from an experiential and interaction viewpoint, kind of how do you want people to feel while they're playing with it? I love the feeling of surprise and kind of amazement, like, uh, when something's so weird, it's funny to you. Like, oh my God, this is so weird. You have to check this out. Oh my God, I love it. Like it, 
it exists in its own space and it it exists to humor you you know and i love that feeling and again it's like old flash sites you know like uh people did this the craziest silliest things like i remember there was this thing where a guy had a he paid a kid to do a portfolio site for him. And it was supposed to be this high end minimalist portfolio site. And the kid put in for the preloader because, you know, older sites had to have these preloaders and they'd take a while to load. The kid put in a Tetris game, a, a game of Tetris. And the guy hated that because it's supposed to be a professional portfolio. But like, you get these silly things you encounter on the web. Like, why did anyone put this here? This is hilarious. And you get fixated on the one weird thing rather than the actual whole, whole that it's part of. So and it's kind of like some, it's sweet too, because this is something I'm, I see a lot with games on itch.io now, you know, like it's the same feeling of amusement and surprise when you just randomly browse itch and you find this strange relic someone left behind and you kind of unpack it and play with it. And it's like the fact that you did discover this is your own experience and it's your own kind of gem. And the fact that you learned how to use it is it's that too. So it's, Stuff again. I feel like it's really unique to computers. Is deciphering uh, strange digital relics, and it's something I think is really cool to put in an art toy. Is you know strange tools that you decipher and find use for on your own, and how to incorporate that into your work. Yeah, there's something almost like a, a an archaeological dig in it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, did you ever play, do you ever, have you ever seen the game Monty Python's Complete Waste of Time? No, I have not. <laughs> it was, it was a CD-ROM back in the day, you know, um, and it was made from Terry Gilliam's collages. So um, the company that made it, which was Seventh Level, I think, um, or I don't remember the name, but they, they basically took all of Terry Gilliam's collage assets and scanned them. And then inspired by his animations, made them into these little game toy things. And it was the first thing that I had ever seen in a, in a computer game that was that in that same way. It was funny. It was completely weird, out of left field, totally surprising, and really a delight. Like when you were talking, I was, I was thinking about how when I was playing Electro Z Maker, I kept going, oh, I love this so much. This is... <laughs> what the fuck is that you know like just kind of this sense of constantly not knowing what's going to happen next um i want to show you what i did because i'm curious to i wanted to talk to you a little bit about the specific affordances that i used on my project on this particular one actually so oh no this is the wrong button all right where's the share screen here we go um so i I did a few different ones. I had just been going to some protests. So the first couple ones I made were, were sort of Black Lives Matter themed with a lot of photographs. But then I decided I just wanted to explore the tools and just do whatever. And this is what the result of that was. Um, and each of these things, as I was playing with them, like this one in particular, the, um, the flower, this is the that custom stamp tool that you made or I'm not mm -hmm. I forget what it was called pattern spray I think pattern spray right so you can make your own shape and then you can basically spray it wherever you want on the surface and as I was doing it I was thinking wow I'm collaborating with Natalie on this <laughs> because I can see my own aesthetic but my own aesthetic is is coming through the lens of your aesthetic and so it becomes a kind of weirdly collaborative in that way um and these two also, this one with this brush, like I thought, I've never seen this kind of brush before. And this is another example of like both of these, this one and this one. This is a brush that you made that only in a pattern that only I could make, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I thought that was interesting and wondered if you wanted to comment at all about like these tools and what you were thinking about when you came up with this, you know, each particular style uh, of tool. This, for anyone who's curious, is this scream into the void <laughs> one. So just, I'd love your, just your thoughts about it. Like, what do you see here in terms of what you were trying to do and how it manifests in a person's specific sort of outcome? 
Yeah, so like the whole process for the tools is interesting because like I mentioned before, like I'm from the whole flash era of the internet and really participated heavily in the, that and uh, all the trends that the technology took. And at the time there were a lot of, so many cool and amazing um, visual experiments, like really beautiful, but also ridiculous things to, um, that people did. And uh, I kind of remember a lot of that. So I thought, you know, with the approaching the tools, it would be really cool to use this as a way of kind of a preservation project too, that kind of preserves old code memes or visual memes and uh, visual ideas that people used to have, you know, so it's like a way of saving that and bringing it into a more uh, recent context, like the brush there, the right next to the um, ASCII one. The, yeah, the, that used to be a uh, very popular thing that people did on, was being passed around on Wander FL. Like, um, so I kind of drew a lot of inspiration from these old things and I put my own spin on it, you know, like the total glitching out or ability to change those kind of things. And mm -hmm. yeah, so it's kind of like a preservation project to me that we don't, forget or lose these old uh, early aesthetics of the web. So a lot of the tools throw back to that. Cool. All right, now I just have to figure out how to turn the screen sharing off. <laughs> Which I don't know. Uh, here we go. There we go. Back to you know, the screen. Great. Cool. Um, is there anything you want to talk about specifically about the project or where, you know, where you like, how you'd like to see people play with it or where you'd like to see it go? Yeah, uh, it's kind of really, I, I'm trying to keep it as silly and goofy and experimental as possible. Like I had this idea recently of maybe also enable uh, animation capability in there so you could have animated scenes and export animated GIFs and, you know, so it's like digital zines too. So, I mean, you know, because why not? And uh, yeah, I had, I was looking at like weird, uh, other templates, like I have one that you can see here, it's like the accordion scene, it's like a tiny little square and lots and lots of pages. So it's, I want to do next the different templates, but also I started thinking it doesn't have to be only print related, it can be digital stuff that it outputs too, like animated GIFs would be really cool. So yeah, it's a very open-ended project. I have an idea for you that you just sparked was it would be cool if you could make an animated gif into a flip book <laughs> yeah I don't yeah how to use yeah <laughs> um great what about sound you have some sound in there it doesn't seem like there's any audio composing bits but there's definitely sound that sort of supports the experience and also has that a little bit of that playfulness can you talk at all about the sound design yeah, um, it sound is something I do at the very end of a project. I'm not completely sure how I want to approach it because I'm also afraid that it's going to become annoying to people because, you know, you, you're you making art and then the tool is squeaking and making cute sounds, you know, like there's a balance there that's really hard to hit. And I mean, the the Electric Z-Maker itself has, you know, usability concerns that have come up and it's kind of a very difficult landscape to navigate, especially if you're making experimental art, like um, there's people that have trouble with the Yankee UI and animations and they just, they want it to be calmer. Or I, I also understand the concerns with the uh, uh, bright, bright flashy colors. There's things that I want to do to fix that, but overall it's like, it's a very, difficult landscape to navigate because if I would tone it down and take all these things out, it would kind of like kill a lot of that makes it unique. So yeah, it's like, it's just stuff that I'm kind of exploring and trying to discover on my own and what's even the best thing to do. And sound is going to be a really big, okay, how do I do this right? So that it doesn't annoy people. It's interesting too. And when you think again about that, that sort of um, integration of tool versus toy, and game like how radically different tool sounds and toy sounds are like you know how when you do something wrong in a tool there's sometimes it's this just thud like boom <laughs> yeah but when you do something wrong in a game there's usually some fairly loud fail noise right uh and you also have 
audio feedback for success, which is also, I don't know, I, I could see you having a lot of fun there, but I can, I can totally understand how like dangerous that might be, right? Because I don't know, sounds in both of those things don't always work very well, even in the best designed ones, right? Mm -hmm. I wasn't, I mean, I spent a lot of time in Second Life, especially over COVID, and the sounds, the sound effects that they give you when you do stuff are terrible. <laughs> They're so annoying, and you're just like, shut up, stop making noise. So that's interesting. I wonder if there's a way to give people, like, I don't know, a way to, like, manipulate the sounds in the same way that they manipulate the visuals, like maybe let them pick their own sound effects, like what error message would you want to use or something mm -hmm. like that. And that, yeah. and that way the what you were talking about, like I've always been a big proponent of customizing your own interface. Um, and, and I like games where I can, you know, put my, my control panel wherever I want it and make whatever kind of map I want and all of that. So that could be an interesting way to solve some of those is just let the user decide what they want to hear, right? Yeah, that's absolutely the way to solve that. It's like uh, the usability concerns that people have been raising. It's like the way I want to fix that is at the very end, just let you customize the UI for the zine maker yourself. Like, you know how I used to customize Windows themes, like you could make your Windows desktop look like anything. But that's like the perfect way of making it accommodate everyone's taste because some people want really wide and loud and colorful things and other people's want people want cute and small and minimalistic, you know, so customization absolutely solves all that. Very cool. Um, we, we wanted to last some time for Q&A, but I don't know if we have any questions coming in. So I guess we'll just keep talking until someone lets us know that there's a question. Um, hey, what are you working on now? Uh, I'm trying to get my head back into the zine maker and adding the different templates and yeah it's it's been very encouraging to see how people really get into it and love it like at the beginning i thought you know it's just going to be a black and white drawing tool that lets you throw things in a template and done and it really grew into a big thing so yeah this is kind of the thing that i'm working on 100 percent now sorry i'm just uh yes uh what was I going to say? Oh, I wanted to switch gears a little bit. Um, one of the things that I want to do, we can do that at the end, but to just remind everyone about the other events we're re, uh, respecting Electric Zine Maker that we're going to be broadcasting in the next week or so. So we'll do that at the end. But um, switch up a gear a little bit. Like, how has the COVID pandemic and the lockdown and all of that? influenced your workflow? Like, do you think it's impacted the way you work or the context or sort of anything about what inspires you or so forth? I'm just curious if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, it's wild because I thought that I might have more time, but it's like there's so much stuff happening all at once that it's actually very draining and distracting from getting stuff done. It seems like, like I put something out just a, I don't know, a week ago, it feels like a year ago. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think it's really impacted everyone's sense of time. And one of the weird things that I've experienced, and I think a lot of people I know, especially creative people and people in academia, is that we're actually more busy than we were before, which is weird. Um, but a lot of it is because we've had to re... So for instance, redesigning the Indicate programming uh, mm -hmm. for an online context has been a lot of work for a lot of people. Um, and so you would think, oh, we're all home, we have all this free time, but we really don't. We actually have a lot more work. Um, we do have some questions coming in, yay. Uh, one of the, so a, a question that came in, this is a great one actually. They wanted to know if you had ever played and done customization with Neopets. I, my sister was heavy into Neopets, so I, participate it with her but I, I myself never had an account and did it but like I was very into friends that were playing with it and doing stuff with it and you know like it was a flash project so I was really heavy into picking apart how they built Neopets and all that but yes I was I, I very much was in love with Neopets. <laughs> very astute question from one of our Twitch viewers. Um, 
that made me think of another question, which was, mm, oh, yes, why didn't I ask this before? What other games have you played and experiences have you done? Like, I'd love to hear two answers. The first is like, as you were coming up, like what games are the most, resonate with you as the most influential? And then the other is like, is there anything interesting you're playing now that you want to talk about? Yeah, uh, when I was coming up, I played a lot with, you know, DOS games, things on a floppy disk. We didn't have really a, uh, the con we never got into consoles because we didn't have the money for it. So we did have a Super Nintendo, which is three games, and we cycled through those all the time. But for me, it was uh, PC games, early desktop games that really influenced me the most, like especially the whole dynamic of, downloads.com before viruses were invented or whatever, you know, like you could just browse and download whatever obscure, strange thing. And, oh my God, this is actually good. Look how strange this is. Like there was one uh, invaders where the person switched out all the alien, the sounds for the game to stupid, goofy, I don't know, human blah, blah, blah. And it was actually a really funny game. Like, so kind of, that was my, play experience, finding strange and obscure things and playing them. And then today's stuff that inspires me a lot is just anything people post on itch, like the, the whole process of browsing itch and finding a obscure little thing that some kid made to prove that to their parents that there's a future in making games, like, and then playing that, like, I, I absolutely love that. I adore that. Like, there's so much of that and it's just such a delight to find them and see how someone's approach to making a game. And I, I mean, of course, then, you know, the a lot of the experimental games that are more known, like I just recently played Nightmare Temptation Academy. I think that's the right way of saying it. It's it's really amazing. And yeah, so there's the newer stuff too, but I, I love everything on itch. No, I mean, it's interesting because in the early nine or the late 90s, there were a group of artists coming out primarily out of like Cal Arts, who were um, sort of game mod and game glitch artists. You probably know some of these people, Anne-Marie Schleiner, Ido Stern, Bertie Condon, and um, Peter Brinson, who teaches at UCLA now. Um, Ido's at, um, I'm sorry, Ido's at UCLA. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and they were doing, they were playing around with game technology and doing a lot of weird glitchy stuff like um, Anne-Marie curated the um, uh, Cracking the Maze online exhibit. And a lot of the work in there, if you haven't seen it, it's very much up your alley. And a lot of it is about like sort of making the technology more obvious and, and exploiting its unique affordances, including playing with glitches and doing things like some of those people were doing things like running. There's also a bunch of Australian artists running a game on the wrong graphics card on purpose to create some weird abstract thing. <laughs> Brody did a bunch of stuff with um, playing around with uh, Sims glitches. It was really interesting and ended up looking very Dali-esque. So that's a kind of very much informed by like an art education. But I, I, I wasn't thinking that your work had that, so I'm not surprised that it doesn't, but there's definitely some shared aesthetic concerns that you might enjoy in that work. Um, we have a, another question. Uh, what gave you the initial idea for the zine maker? Did you like zines for a while or was it a specific thing that made you decide to make it? I mean, yeah, the last thing I made was Everything is Going to Be Okay, which I describe as an interactive zine. And I drew heavily from zine culture and the whole I, process of how people make zines, you know, so zine aesthetics to make that. And I guess the next obvious thing was to make a little thing that lets you just build zines. And I wanted, I, the intention was that it's going to be small. I didn't, you know, like, okay, I'll just quickly throw this together. And it ended up actually being pretty successful. People loved it. So I started building more on it and exploring that. Yeah. So it was a transition from the last thing I made. I mean, it's also interesting because there is a subset of people, even though they're very different aesthetically from your work, there is a subset of people, you know, Anna Anthropy's book on uh, what is the, the video game Zinesters, right? Um, Rise of the Video Game seems, Zinesters seems like it applies very much to the kind of work you're doing as well. That sort of DIY um, aspect, I think, is part of what, you know, and from, from the perspective of Indicate, I think we want 
people to feel like game making is accessible and not this weird arcane thing that you have to know a bunch of technical stuff to do, but something you can just jump into and try and experiment with. Like, I think what Electric Zine Maker kind of gets that message across, like just try things and have fun and, and uh, see where it takes you, right? Um, I have the plug for, so this is what's coming up. If people are, are tuning in late or if you wanna do see some more of Electric Zine Maker, this is what we're doing. Tomorrow at 11 a.m. Pacific, Pendleton Ward and Jamie Pirano will make a zine together, followed by Ian Hink making a zine at noon Pacific. And um, you should be sure and tune in to Indicate's Twitch stream throughout the summer. Every Wednesday and Sunday, we're going to be doing uh, various um, activities online. And uh when you guys uh the note i got here says tomorrow at 11 a.m are you is that saturday or sunday because i thought that was going to be on sunday um i'll see if i get a message from somebody about that in a minute um sunday yeah okay it's not tomorrow that's what i thought uh sunday at 11 uh again making a zine and then another at 12 uh so it's ian hink at 12 jamie pereno and pendleton ward at 11. Um, any other questions coming in? I guess not. Um, well, we have a couple more minutes. Um, I don't know if I had anything else I wanted to ask you about or talk to you about. Um, if you were gonna give um, some tips or advice to somebody who is now young, let's say like when you started, you were in high school, right? What was the first year that you came to Indicate? Uh, I submitted to Indicate for the very first Indicate. And then uh, I think it was the uh, E3 showcase when Tetra again was there in 2013, I think. But I've been watching the festival ever since the first one. Cool. Yeah, I remember meeting you at that E3 showcase and playing Tetragedon and, and being like, this is just so crazy original. It made me so happy to sit with there. And um, it's really great to see you just having stuff in now pretty regularly and, and winning awards. Ah, here's a question. Um, <laughs> Oh, I, I'm not sure exactly what this question is, but I'll try to try to translate it. How has the response been to making Electric Zine Maker open source? Oh, did you make it open source? Yeah, I managed to get it done. <laughs> ah, okay, great. Uh, so now I understand that question. And then th this person wanted to know, how has that response to that been? And also, are you considering doing that for future projects? I mean, uh, I work in really weird combinations of tech and a lot of the stuff I do is also flash based air 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 apps. So, you know, my, my assumption usually is that no one is interested or it's weird. So I, you know, I, I have insecurity that's about sharing code, but I love open sourcing stuff. And uh, yeah, I mean, since it seems like there's interest and in, yeah, I'm definitely doing that in future projects. I mean, it doesn't take much just to throw something up on GitHub and forget about it, you know. Yeah, and I guess if people want to mess with it, they'll mess with it, right? It doesn't, you don't have to necessarily service what people are using with tools, right? Yeah. They have to come to your tools if they want to mess with your code. <laughs> I mean, cool. it's, it's so great because it's also how I learned how to program by open source stuff, just dissecting how did this person write this and yeah, okay, this is how you put things together so it runs and yeah. I think it's really great that you're messing around with Flash because I think it's something that, you know, when Flash first came out, it was, I think, a defining moment where game making became a lot more accessible than it had mm -hmm. been previously. And it's unfortunate. I mean, now we, we have a lot of tools, but most of those tools are very 3D. And the problem with 3D, and this is a thing nobody really talks about, is assets. So you can, it's easy to code in Unity in 3D. You know, you, you can, I think you can teach yourself or get online videos, but you have to make 3D models or get them somewhere. 
So I have a lot of students who are like, oh, I, I can make levels in Unity, but I can't, I don't know how to use Maya. So I think people don't realize that those 3D engines also end up sucking you into other tools that you might not necessarily want to be messing around with. Whereas Flash is just basically, you know, 2D, whatever JPEGs or GIFs or whatever that you can, it's much easier to create assets for it, right? And I think that's an important, one of the things that makes it accessible and also makes it feel and look accessible is that there's not three-dimensional models you have to wrestle with. Yeah, I think it still is a singular technology, technology, especially the IDE, like you had this very rich animation environment as well as coding. And that combination is something that a lot of people have tried to kind of copy or mimic. And I tried all the other alternatives and stuff. It's There's still nothing like it. And I feel like it's very much of the um, misunderstood technology. It, pioneered the web, it built the web we have today, yet we still managed to figure out a way of hating it to death, you know, and uh, how advertisers kind of pushed it out, or it's really a lot of issues with the online advertising that ended up creating the groundwork for that. But like that technology, there's still so much to throw back to and explore with it and just the concepts and philosophies surrounding it that created kind of like this whirlwind that made the what the web is today like it's something that I, I feel like I'm not done with it like there's still so much to be said with that technology yeah that's so great and you know I was also thinking um it's interesting that thing about sort of dead tech like I think a lot of game developers in the indie scene like to play around with dead genres and dead tech like I talked earlier about platformers when we first started um it was just a couple of years after the adventure game genre died, mm -hmm. but indie developers were all over it in a minute, you know? <laughs> and, so, and, and it's great to see like, as the AAA industry for the first few years we were doing Indicade, we're sort of ignoring um, adventure games. And then they caught up and started making games like, you know, Life is Strange, right? <laughs> Which even though it's a AAA game, clearly has some, connection to the indie trend in adventure games. So I think that's really interesting. And I think it also speaks to this idea of the sort of ahistoricism that we tend to have. Like, I love to talk to people, when you, you said floppy disks, I like to say, uh, oh yeah, when floppy disks were floppy, like, you know, when yeah. I started using, they were big and they were floppy. And if you spilled coffee on them, you lost all your data, you know, like, um, and it's interesting that we, because we're so, you know, always looking to the future and the faster and the, and the more high tech, we ignore our own heritage. Mm -hmm. And you think about filmmakers, like indie filmmakers who were making, who made black and white films in the 90s, right? Um, again, going back to the roots of the medium and going back to an earlier aesthetic, we get some really great work out of the, the sort of, um, the convergence of, contemporary sensibilities and older aesthetics and technologies. And I think that's what's really interesting about your work is it can't, it couldn't have been made back in those days, right? Because your sensibility is very contemporary, mm -hmm. um, but it's unique to that tech as well. And it also, I think maybe it's one of the reasons your work stands out because you are one of the few people that are still using flash and so, or flash like aesthetics and so, that also weirdly makes you very distinctive in your design style. Yeah, I feel like often uh, what our concept of the future moving forward is not often better. And the fact that computer culture loses history so easily, like especially games, you know, like it's five years and then everyone forgot about it and they're reinventing the same wheel, you know? So having that understanding and a kind of respect to everything that came before that and trying to understand what made it special is what makes your work special because you have a love for it, you know? Yeah, and I mean, you, you, you do see a parallel with this in film, you know, like most of Melier's films, which were pioneering, he's basically invented special effects, were melted and made into boot bottoms for the war, right? Yeah. I mean, that's how trivialized his work was. And I think, you know, we've been having a big 
um, there's been a big debate going on in academic circles over the last couple of years because there are people who are trying to archive and collect um, older games and the, the game industry has been very resistant because of their concerns about copyright and IP. At the same time, you have like my nephew, when he was a kid, he was playing, I think he's probably in his late twenties now, he was playing abandonware games from a site in France. Like he would find these wacky old games and I'd be like, where did you get that? Oh, I found this abandonware site in France where the people are re basically reverse engineering these old games. And I think there's an audience for that too. Just like, you know, when you turn on Netflix, there's also an audience for old movies, right? Mm -hmm. People still want to see that stuff. And the, the sad thing I think about it, what's really tragic, I mean, I have some games over here on my, on my extensive collection that you cannot play anymore, like because they're literally on a floppy disk and there's no drives that will read it. Um, or there's no software, you know, I have CD-ROMs that there's no hardware for CDI, I have CDI disks over here. Like, you know, I guess I could probably find one on eBay, but um, so we, we need to, I think as a community, especially like this is a good place for academics and indies to kind of come together is we need to think about our history a little more and figure out, you know, I don't know how, if I tell my students, oh, have you ever played this game? Like, it's a game they can't even play now. I feel like if I was a film teacher and I said, oh, I want you to watch, you know, uh, Battleship Potemkin by Sergei Eisenstein, they can watch it. But if I say, I want you to play the original version of Sim City, the black and white hypercard version, <laughs> right? They can't do it. So I'd love it if we, if we could find a way to, you know, in a way, the work you're doing calls attention to that forgotten history, but it would also be great if we could figure out a way to actually preserve the history in some way. Yeah, like literally everything you said is just so right on. Like, yes, 100%, you know. It, it's wild too, because we're stuck on a platform and kind of like just the whole concept of technology is kill the old, kill the old, kill the old. It's deprecated, it's obsolete. Like, it, you just, even with programming, oh, it's deprecated now, don't dare use it, but it's better. Why can't I use it? You know, like, it's just the, the very foundation the games find themselves on is built on uh, disrespecting and forgetting the past because it's somehow worst or not good. Where it, we're in art also, you can't do that. You need a history and build on itself. Like you have to see, you draw a line back from the beginning to current, you know? So it's very conflicting and kind of self-destructive and like, we totally need to have an understanding of preservation. Like that's just such a solution to so many problems when it, it just, you know, yeah. Like the fact that we're going to lose all this flash history, it just really bothers me. What, like for what reason? Because some main players in web tech decided it needs to die and they all decided it's going to be booted and smeared its reputation. But like, that's a lot of history and work out there. It's just going to not be accessible anymore. And that alone is such a loss because if, you know, like we look at uh, tragic moments in history where we lost a lot of stuff like the library of Alexandria burning and we view that as tragic. Why don't we view that happening on the web or in games as tragic, you know? We do it to ourselves. I mean, it'd be like if, if the people that own the Library of Alexandria had burned it down themselves, right? <laughs> it's, yeah. Uh, it's crazy. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. I think I would like to, I don't know, I thought a lot about this. I want, I've been wanting to, um, I, I have, a, I'm co-editing a book series and the idea of it was one of the things I wanted people to do was write about dead tech. Like I would love somebody to write about these lost multimedia platforms. If you read game histories, a lot of times they don't even mention any of these old tech things as if they never happened. They just evaporate. And I think you made, you made a really good point, which I think this is kind of a good point to close on too, because it relates back to Indicate and, and really why Indicate started, which is that who gets to decide what tech lives and what tech dies is almost always, at least in the United States, driven by capitalist mm -hmm. um, control and monetization concerns, not necessarily by creative affordances. And part of what indies bring to the table, I think, is exactly that. Like, we're not there for the corporate or the advertising or whatever. We're there for like, what can we say with these technologies? Mm -hmm.
Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of like the people, it's a control of history and uh, we control our own history too with the way we preserve and decide to look back at these technologies in a fonder way, you know? Yeah, that's that's great. I think that's a perfect place to end on. We're just at three o'clock, so, um, or three o'clock my time, I guess noon California time. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Natalie. It's been such a delight talking to you. I just, I'm such a big fan of your work and I love hearing your thoughts. I think you have such a unique take on everything and your aesthetics are so distinct and uh, yeah, keep up the good work. We hope to see any indicates in the future. I'm going to do a quick plug for those who came in late. We have um, Sunday uh, at 11 a.m. Uh, Pacific Pendleton Ward and Jamie Perenna will, will make a zine. And then at noon Pacific, uh, Ian Hink will make a zine. So we'll have lots of live streaming right here on our Twitch channel of different people making zines with Electric Zine Maker. Um, and again, I wanna thank you, uh, Natalie Lawhead from Alien Melon for joining us for this uh, summer session uh, of IndieCade. Thank you for having me, this is fun. All right, I'm gonna turn my camera off because I think that's what, what I'm supposed to do at this point. <laughs>